Dr. Badri Raghavan, Chief Data Scientist, Ola. Mayur Datar, Chief Data Scientist, VP of Engineering, Flipkart. Mr. Dr. Madhu Gopinathan, Vice President, Data Science, Make My Trip. Welcome. Abhijit Singh, Head of Business Technology Group, ICICI Bank. Sudipta Ghosh, Data and Analytics Leader, PwC India. And Rajat Tyagi, CIO, PVR Limited. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I wanted to start with, uh, with the great debate uh, between, going on between Elon Musk and uh, Mark Zuckerberg. So, you know, Elon Musk believes that it's time for, that machines could actually kill humans. He's being joined by Bill Gates, who also thinks that there is need for control, enormous control over machines. And uh, uh, then you have Zuckerberg on the other side, who says, you know, let's push this through, let's go ahead with it. Uh, I wanted to first go around and ask who is on the eyes side of uh, artificial intelligence and how many of you are on the nice side of artificial intelligence. You'd like to start with this? On the, I, I, I would say I'm on the, maybe on the Zuckerberg side, but, okay. but I would, as always, I believe the truth lies somewhere in the middle, so not on the extremes. Okay. I'm a Elon Musk fan, so okay. it's, it's a tough choice. I think both are right, but I would uh, concur with Elon Musk on that. Okay, Sudipta? Well, just like a true consultant, I will say it depends. <laughs> um, but what I'm going to take, answer your question very quickly is that I think the underlying cause of this debate is the question about trust and transparency. Yeah. So um, if we have got an ability to understand what an AI algorithm is doing, mm -hmm. Uh, then these debates will not really happen because you'll have a better control. Sure. And uh, actually organizations are talking about how to use responsible AI and uh, how to use explainable AI. But there again, if you leave it to the machine, the machine will decide what that algorithm will be. Yes. And then you may not even know what that algorithm is. So, so there, is a, there is a huge... Uh, what about you? Yeah, so my view is that you know, artificial intelligence is not there yet. Yeah. It can think on its own and take a call. Yeah. And, uh, you know, any technology can have a positive and a negative, you know, impact. And it is how humans use technology. And, you know, I am with Zuckerberg in the sense that, you know, we should go forward with it. There is a you know, tremendous amount of uh, uh, usage of uh, machine learning. And it is not, you know... Uh, uh, actual system, you know, taking a call and deciding the future of mankind. It is us, you know, using that technology for betterment of mankind. Okay, Mayur. Yeah, so <clears throat> I think uh, I would like to echo the sentiment of uh, Rajat in that uh, I feel, um, you know, it, well, so it, it's here and it's going to be there because it has tremendous benefits from a productivity perspective and so on. I also feel that as of now, there's no evidence that, uh, you know, this technology has a conscience or a mind of its own that it's going to take over and, you know, rule us. So those still feel like unwarranted fears. And so in that sense, I would say that I'm more in the Zuckerberg camp. And in terms of do we have a choice? Of course we don't have a choice. I mean, there's a lot of goodness, there's a lot of value, and therefore no one can stop this technology uh, from unleashing uh, the, the gains and uh, going down this path. Okay. Yeah, so I think you'll find most practicing, you know, AI practitioners, if you want to call them machine language practitioners, pretty much you'll find on the, on violent the agreement on some things. And yeah. it's because as a practitioner, you start to realize the limits of what you can actually do as opposed mm -hmm. to what you might hear in the popular media. So, you know, just there's not so much more to add to that, but maybe another perspective is something I heard from a colleague who tried to explain it. You know, AI is sort of in the stage of a five-year-old, right? You need to teach your value systems to a five-year-old. They, they haven't developed their own sort of independence yet. 
and that's what Mayur, you were talking about. It's not, you know, it's not the a reach the stage of a teenager who are making self-aware decisions and develop the full, you know, sure. value system. So, given that until uh, we reach that point, we are, you know, the the, the benefits are just too great to ignore. Mm-hmm. And and I think you know we need to be aware of the control, like with any technology, you need to be aware of, you know, the ethical and moral concerns. But we're not at the point of you know being ruled by robots, so that's fine. Okay. Yeah, I, I'd like yeah. to basically echo that. So I think you know it's a great debate. I think they've done a, a good service of bringing this up. I mean, Elon Musk basically is driving an AI machine. Yes. He's building an AI yes. machine. It's completely uh, in that realm. But I think the point there is that he's bringing about saying, hey, we need to be careful about how we develop this technology. Just like nuclear technology, for example, right? So there's a lot of benefit, but we need to make sure the human is in the loop. Uh, we need to make sure we have the right processes and the right debate to ensure that it doesn't go well. Um, so, so you are in the Zuckerberg camp, camp as well? No, I'm, I'm actually saying that it is, I mean, I don't think that Elon Musk is saying anything different than what Zuckerberg Not very different, yes. He's saying it's very important. We have to go ahead. I mean, he's doing that, but he's saying we should be careful about how we develop this technology. And I actually, uh, I think so too. Basically, we have to make sure that we are uh, responsible in how we develop it. And we have a regular debate about how we develop it. But we do need to keep going. Yeah, I think, and I think the fear comes from this whole... Uh, statement which says that um, it could eventually kill humans. They'll, they'll get and they'll be against humans finally. I think that's where the, that's really the, the crux of it. Because John Chambers we met, you know, he said that whether you like it or you don't like it, it will happen. It's already happening. What do you make? Yeah, so, you know, I, I was uh, listening to somebody else. I forgot who it was. And uh, he basically said machines have been killing humans for a long time. <laughs> Okay, yes. whether it's a, it's whether a, it's a car or it's a, a car, yes. or in fact, uh, it happened to one of those Tesla things. Uh, this guy, even though it says don't operate, uh, you know, in a in an auto driver mode. Yes. And and it just ran straight into a truck because it right. thought it was the horizon. Correct. And so th- there are going to be accidents, and it will happen. It's just how we deal with it, and how we prepared we are for it, right? We need to look at boundary conditions and make sure we are ready for those things. Okay. Moving on, um, we, we knew there were neural networks. You know, 1980s was all about neural networks. And uh, this is a evolution of the neural networks in some ways. How different do you think uh, uh, AI of today is from neural networks of the 80s? And what really are those factors that have made the difference uh, between the neural networks and, uh, and AI? Yeah, actually, it's a wonderful question. Something most of us, we were just talking yes. about so it. We'll, we'll we will actually go we through, lived, we lived through yes. this. Um, so, 85 was a pivotal point, right? Uh, back propagation was developed, and neural networks went from a single layer to multiple layers. That's deep learning and. Not yet deep learning. Okay. Um, so, what happened was there was a lot of hype about neural networks at that time. People said there's going to be walking, talking robots in the next five years or 10 years. Obviously, that promise didn't yield. Yeah. But the fundamental di- difference in the resurgence, the technology already existed. Deep learning was also in the late 1980s and 90s, it started coming up. The difference was amount of data that's available now. That's right. So as you have deeper and deeper neural networks, you need more and more data sure. for it to be able to learn. And the technology is actually rapidly improved in two different vari- ways, right? One, computing power, cloud. And as Satya keeps saying, democratizing the web, right? we have, you don't as a small company or even a large company you need to build a huge data center. Mm-hmm. You can go rent space whenever you want it yeah. and rent, rent the computing power. Sure. So this and advances in, in GPU and all, all other things have actually boosted this development and taken yeah. it to the next level. Yeah. Dr. Badri? <coughs> yeah, very similar remarks, you know, in, in terms of um, AI is of obviously a collection of tools and technologies and neural networks and variants of it are yeah. one of those tools. And of course, the big revolution has come in the past few years with the introduction of the sort of deep learning embedded sort of nested networks and adversarial networks and so on. But I think what's pro- propagated is exactly what Radhakrishna is saying is about sort of the edge computing 
devices which are collecting the data and interacting with humans, and this combination of these deep networks that are sort of making human-like judgments, and I want to use that word carefully. So it's that combination of ability to process data at the edge, also, you know, whatever's going on in the cloud, you know, syncing up at night and so on. But um, it's that combination of development of the theoretical advances in neural networks as well as the sort of processing. This is exactly what you were saying as well. That's what led to all, yeah. the, all the excitement about these yeah. technologies. But fundamentally, it's just an evolution and sure. progression in our sort of better mathematical understanding, if you want to call it that. Sure. Yeah. Mayur, uh, data and computation, what else? <coughs> Anything else? I think um, it's a matter of nomenclature. I mean, if you pick up the the standard textbook on AI by uh, Russell and Norvig, right? There are so many aspects of AI that are receiving are like are not so much in the limelight as uh, neural networks are. Yeah. Uh, you know, whether it is planning, whether it is uh, uh, many other things like logistic regression and so on. Right? These technologies have been around. These technologies have been used. Like just to give you an example, right? Uh, logistic regression um, in companies like Google uh, decides which ads get shown on which ho web pages and so on. And at a hum humongous scale. Like at a million times every second, uh, you know, Google is deciding which ads to show sure. on which web pages, right? Sure, sure. Uh, there's information retrieval, etc. I think what is different about deep neural networks is that, you know, it's a generic enough algorithm that it can subsume a few other algorithms and off late because of the advancements in computing and the, the scale of data. What you've seen is like there are five or six different uh, applications where it has done as best as the up till now best algorithm, right? Okay. And then suddenly that has kind of gained the attention of a lot of people. So I guess to answer your question, I feel that AI is a lot more than just deep neural networks, uh, but suddenly, suddenly that technology has come of age and, and it's finding its uh, roots and uh, success stories in a lot of use cases. Dr. Madhu? Uh, yeah, I would like to, you know, second, you know, my use uh, point of view. Uh, I think uh, other than, uh, you know, ability to have, uh, you know, this technology and use it, um, the thing that I find very unique today is that neural nets are, you know, most of the research is available uh, in open source and, you know, companies are able to apply it very quickly. And, uh, you know, I've seen, you know, a lot of uh, technology you know, which a lot of, you know, large, uh, you know, uh, leaders in the industry are making available uh, to everyone to evaluate, to use, and uh, process unstructured data. So neural nets are really, you know, enabling us and, you know, companies in India, like, you know, at PVR, you know, we have been able to apply, uh, you know, artificial intelligence and machine learning to better understand Customer so the deployment is much faster yeah, because so of the very easy for us what's available. We have access to okay. this technology, okay. which was earlier, you know, I think mm -hmm. would require, you know, a lot of research, mm -hmm. you know, technical background, you know, mm -hmm. data scientists, and a lot of, you know, uh, resources and cloud computing and so on, which is now so easily available for everyone sure. to use. Sure. So <coughs> I would say that apart from whatever uh, we all spoke about, which I completely agree with, um, one critical difference is the types of use cases in the kind of industries where AI can be used, um, which has become a, a real differentiator of late. Mm -hmm. So whether we are talking about improving the healthcare um, experience, whether we are talking about providing advanced information about the crops to the farmers, or whether we are talking about detecting frauds in financial services, we are seeing that AI is no longer something which is something different and special. It is getting embedded into a daily situation. Even the fa very fact that you use uh, a navigator which also has got an element of AI, uh, which we don't even realize more often than not, uh, has made it very, very ubiquitous. So apart from, of course, the advancements in the technology, uh, the, the almost explosion of data, yeah. uh, either because of the persistent digital lifestyle of humans or because of the Internet of Things, uh, and also the fact that the costs have significantly gone down, whether it's the cost of uh, the hardware or the equipment, or it's a cost of not being able to know which algorithms need to be used, etc., democratization. I would say that the um, use of uh, AI in day-to-day -day operations, uh, both in the front office and back office, has significantly changed the way in which it is now getting perceived in most of the organizations. Okay.
your yeah. thoughts on yeah i i think i didn't see the names abhijit okay so i think uh, you know uh, what i do feel is neural networks are nothing but building blocks for ai yeah. look at it you know in in that sense yeah so with the amount of uh, data that is available and the processing capacity you know that has gone up exponentially mm -hmm. today it is possible to do lot of things which we could not do but still today for example i cannot take you know a flower to a computer and say smell it and tell me what flower it is yeah. it will still take some time to reach that stage yeah, yeah. but uh, neural networks are really you know as uh, rightly pointed by rajat and other colleagues on this panel it is very easy to do i think the ease it, with which these algorithms are available many times you don't really need to understand the deep mathematics behind it but you can actually use it run it on data yeah. use lot of associative algorithms and do lot of good things mm -hmm. so i don't see any difference between the two coming back to your question but i think one is leading to the other sure so it's a natural evolution yeah. dr madhu <coughs> yeah so i would say uh, artificial intelligence was a general concept and nowadays i think people talk about artificial general intelligence to kind of differentiate it from a narrow intelligence that you know some of the current uh, deep learning neural networks are excelling at so i would point out that i think uh, one of the uh, earliest references to this uh, there's a philosopher named polanyi i think he's a polish philosopher so it's referred to as polanyi's paradox mm -hmm. which is that uh, we know more than what we can say uh, so a simple example is we all know how to ride a bicycle but it's very hard to probably write down all the precise instructions <laughs> yeah. to you know how to ride a bicycle right so which was one of the gaps in achieving this vision of artificial intelligence and i think that is where deep learning or neural networks has made a breakthrough in that you know how do you recognize speech or how do you uh, recognize an image of your you know of your relative uh, it's it's very hard for a programmer to write down the instructions but uh, you know with enough data these networks are able to figure that out Uh, so i think that is so in in that sense neural networks is, is is a way to reach that you know artificial intelligence but there are other methods sure. right uh, there have been logic there has been uh, analogy you know it, it seems like uh, you know scientists who study the human brain think that the brain uses a lot of analogical reasoning uh, none of this has kind of come into the limelight because you know the current wave is kind of uh, you know with deep learning um so i would also say you know the, the goal of artificial general intelligence in the yes. sense that yes. reaching to a more general thing is still way out of reach yeah. and tied back to this earlier point of elon musk where you know we are going to be killed by robots walking on the street so yes. that probably is you know much much further away yes. you know. so so when you know we were working on this cover story on uh, on artificial intelligence for business today and the the way i re reasoned this whole work that's going on in the area of artificial intelligence was that it's an attempt uh, by the science to surmount the three inferiorities that machines have over humans one is the brain one is the visual element which is the eyes and the third is the ability to speak and listen and uh, so and you're working in all these areas so let's hear from you what is it that one can expect on the three, on these three fronts uh not just from microsoft but also in the in the general uh, evolution of artificial intelligence uh. yeah so um so let's let me take the speech part first right um specifically you know i mean there there are competitions that go on and google microsoft amazon all of them are participating in that and for the latest benchmark uh, for telephonic speech right microsoft uh, team in uh, microsoft research in uh, in the us they got human parity mm -hmm. so again it's because of uh, the amount of data the processing and stuff that we are able to actually do now and deep neural networks is a, is one of the manifestations uh, of deep is being able to get the speech data so there's going to be advances all over and so what's the application associated with it so for example uh, specifically I, i know google does this too but microsoft specifically has uh, these uh, skype translator type things where you yes. can you can actually talk in one language mm -hmm. say french mm -hmm. and the other person at the end of the skype call mm -hmm. actually receives it in person. english okay. and goes back and it's been actually uh, changed to the next level where almost like the un translation system where one person's talking in english and then there are 20 different people having their choice of language translated to so it's actually percolating from 
a research area where the sensors are developing all the way on to applications that are real uh, usage in telemedicine, for example. So expert uh, who is somewhere else speaking a different language, and there's a village in Africa where you can actually... Uh, so speech is... So this is one. That is what one. about the... Um, in intelligence in general, right, I mean, it's a very broad word. Yeah. So it actually uh, encompasses a whole bunch of things, sure. not just uh, neural networks or deep neural networks, but a whole bunch of processing that's going on. For example, uh, just self-driving car is, an, is, is just an amazing example sure. of navigation. And uh, recently, actually, uh, there was a, a couple of uh, prototypes that was generated from Microsoft where... Uh, a blind person was able to walk by scene recognition. Mm -hmm. So it's actually, uh, the processing has gotten to such a point that he has the spectacles which looks at uh, the scene that's uh, in front of him. He obviously can't see, but the image is coming in. Automatically, it's translating to him saying, here is a, a pole, here's a dog, here's a person in front, and it gives you an idea. Sure. So it actually, is, mm -hmm. general intelligence is starting to come up uh, to some extent. And the, the third one was... Uh, sense uh, vision. vision. So this was the vision part. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but intelligence in general actually encompasses yeah, in all of those things. Absolutely. Dr. Badri, how, how is it being deployed uh, at your uh, firm and any other use cases which you think might be of interest uh, and you think are, are fascinating use cases yeah. because it's a very, very complex subject to talk about. Yes, yes. It's, it's, a, it's a fantastic question and I think any one of us can probably speak for half mm -hmm. an hour which is not <laughs> what you want. So, but, but um, you know, very, very, very much uh, following on as for those of you who stayed this morning, you yeah. saw the announcement, yes. partnership announcement that Ola and Microsoft have come to to take advantage of, in fact, some of these technologies. Yes, you know, we are, as a mobility company, we are interested in sort of leveraging technology as much as we can. We, we, we have 20% of the world's population. We have to figure out uh, uh, sort of a less resource-intensive way to move a billion people, sure. right? And technologies in general, and AI in particular, specifically for in ca use cases where, you know, you're not particularly literate. So, for example, uh, in, in our CAVs, we are working, um, for example, active research on getting to understand um, spoken Indian languages. And as you know, as many of you know, in India, we don't actually speak only one language. We tend to mix, you know, Hindi and English and Tamil mm -hmm. and Telugu mm -hmm. and what have you. So trying to sort of parse all that to, to understand the driver, if he's, if he's, to if the he driver, he's the... speaking to his okay. device to say, okay. you know, tell me how much money did I make today or tell me, you know, when is my last trip home okay. and ask in his or, you know, her language to understand. Mm -hmm. So that's a particular use case where humans are now understanding using speech to understand it. Um, vision, very much, we are interested in the notion of improving safety. Yeah. And these, even if not self-driving cars, but more sort of safer semi-autonomous cars is what sure. we call them. So using sort of using LiDAR technology, for example, that's telling us when to detect objects and say which is a cow and which is a, you know, sure. the, uh, which is a horizon, basically. Mm -hmm. So we are using some of those technologies. Or like Bhavish well. said in the morning to bring the car to a stop if the driver is sleepy. That's right. So right? we are working, for example, on sure. drowsiness detection. It's a great example as well. So in using AI technologies that's looking at your field of vision and your gaze and direction to say, you know, is it safe to drive or not? Sure. So this is not just a you know, Western economy thing. Mm -hmm. um, many other cases and sort of safety, in, for example, we are looking at um, you know, facial authentication and voice authentication to improve safety or, you know, passenger mm -hmm. safety, driver safety, mm -hmm. etc. So the use cases, of course, are endless. Um, I'll just stop there. Okay. Sure so others you are going to add. Lots of use cases at Flipkart. Certainly. And I think I had uh, three or four comments on this, and I'll keep it quick. One is to first to answer your question about Flipkart, right? Uh, we use it a lot to understand our product images, extract a lot of uh, information and attributes out of them. Uh, and also uh, to handle the, the volume of calls that we get for a customer service. Um, so uh, certainly a lot of um, uh, productivity improvements that we have through these cognitive uh, services and abilities. I think um, outside of Flipkart, I feel that what has changed recently is the fact that, you know, in all of these three, right, whether it is uh, speech, 
vision and, and, and of course you mentioned about the brains which I interpret as just uh, you know, logic, uh, language understanding and so on and so forth, right? Uh, we have really sort of reached a point where uh, these technologies are now part of your homes, right? Sure. Part of your phones, they're part of your kitchen and so on mm -hmm. and so forth. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's going to accelerate a lot. What you'll start seeing are multimodal interfaces, where it's going to be speech plus vision uh, uh, together. Uh, today, I think we are still kind of aware and conscious when we interact with computers. I think the next big leap is going to be when you'll seamlessly be talking to your home, to your refrigerator, to your oven, and so on and so forth, right? And okay. people are already talking to their cars, yeah. uh, etc. So I think that's certainly going to happen in the next five to six years. The only sort of challenge there is going to be like... Uh, you're going to be watched all the time, literally, uh, and you know how to deal with the yeah. privacy. So we ha I have a question on that. Yeah, we'll yeah. come to that. But uh, Rajat, yeah, sure. Yeah. So at uh, you know at PVR, you know it's a movie exhibition business, and you know while you know the experience is going to a theater and mm -hmm. watching a movie, mm -hmm. uh, you know the customer behavior has been changing. You know, mm -hmm. now we are all becoming more digitally savvy. Everyone is using mobile phones. And over the last few years, a uh, majority of our customers are booking online. They are engaging with the, you know, with the cinema exhibitors online. And uh, that has given us access to a lot of information about your behavior. You know, what movies do you like? What genre of movies do you like? Which languages you, you, know, you would like, like to watch? And using all of that information, you know, we are able to now personalize communication. So instead of sending a communication to all the users that this is the new movie which is coming, based on your behavior, you know, I can use machine learning to find out which is the most likely movie that you would like to watch. And you know, how I can personalize this communication to you and send you offers that are more relevant to your taste. Uh, so I think that is one. And the second, you know, we have been also uh, you know, experimenting with a chatbot. So we have on PVR, you know, cinemas.com, we have ability to book tic tickets on a conversational platform. And we've seen a fairly good usage of it, though the movie ticket booking experience itself is very intuitive and easy. Mm -hmm. We see customers, you know, prefer to communicate, you know, in spoken language, to search for movies which are running near them, uh, booking tickets in a much more, you know, easier to converse uh, medium. Mm -hmm. And we have now been, you know, experimenting, like, you know, like Mayur was mentioning, a voice-based, you know, booking, uh, booking uh, service. So, you know, a lot of, okay. uh, like, so that you, you know, like, you know, Amazon, Alexa, and Google, okay. and Microsoft, okay. and everyone is coming out with these technologies okay. where you can book you know, tickets, you know, through a voice medium. Mm -hmm. And we have been working on that. And, you know, there are a lot of very interesting use cases. And every every few weeks, you know, we come out with new ideas sure. and we are very excited to you know, experiment with them. Okay. Sudipta, so use cases, some of the more interesting ones that you come, you've come across? Yeah, m multiple. So I will take a few of them which are uh, interesting. So first one is the voice analysis. Uh, particularly for a call center organization sure. where you have a lot of customer calls coming in and uh, now we are doing one uh, piece of work where we are analyzing the intonation and the anxiety uh, in the voice as opposed to just looking only at the text because sometimes you can be very polite in talking but you are sure. really seething with anger and you know vice versa so uh, so there is a good amount of you know interesting case around looking at the voice, using it for analysis, using that to train your, either you train your uh, people who are servicing the calls or you actually automate the responses okay. which you can do using chatbots, etc. So that is one. Second is uh, on um, a lot of uh, use cases around interpretation of images, whether it's a static image or whether it's a video uh, image. So for example, uh, we did one project where looking at the satellite image of a particular city, you can draw a lot of conclusions about the economic potential of a particular part of a city. Not just that, depending on the deep learning algorithm, you can find out similarities of, say, one part of a city to another part of a different city okay. and consider them as part of the same target population for you to either open a store or open an ATM uh, branch, etc. Okay. So that's a great example. So this is how the it looks from the top. 
is, is you're looking at the you're just looking at the satellite image okay. nothing more mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. so it's fairly uh, you know standardized mm-hmm. uh, when when i'm talking about the video uh, so there is a huge amount of data which gets captured in the cctv footage right so uh, so uh, we are currently working on number of projects where we are seeing uh, whether that can be used for improving the either the health and safety or the surveillance um you know um surveillance from the perspective of a construction company from the perspective of a retail company uh, where you need to see whether people are not having the you know different type of behavior which you do not expect so the the point there is that you are identifying patterns or identifying instances which do not conform to the normal behavior sure that's where the deep learning becomes important comes into play and then you are automatically raising an alarm so you're not replacing a human being who's looking who's sitting at the control room you're actually increasing the efficacy of that person by alerting to him at the right moment sure. so that that person has got the time to react sure because more often than not if you are at the 2 o'clock in the morning you're looking at five different terminals you're not really in your best senses Perfect. to react to a situation so it's helping okay. you to do that okay right? so i talked about the text i talked about the video the last bit which is the intelligence bit we are seeing a lot of it and i'll take the most commonly used example which is where we are predicting when a p- particular asset or a particular machine is going to fail so it's a predictive maintenance sure. which has got a huge amount of widespread application whether it's an airlines or whether it's a large manufacturing company uh, or you know transportation company etc or utilities for that matter yeah utilities yes. you can see a huge amount of savings like right. so you know there was a news for long reasons you know few days back so f- if you have the ability to predict when there is going to be a failure of a machine or a part of a machine in advance with a reasonable degree of accuracy you can significantly improve the health and safety you can yeah. significantly reduce the cost of your operations sure. and that's really a game changer sure abhijit i say here i think uh, a lot of interesting uh, examples we have done so you know a chatbot called ipal uh, has had wide exposure so it solved about 6 million queries at 90% plus accuracy levels and very easy to work with mm-hmm. um, we have done a lot of work on the voice you know as somebody on the panel rightly pointed out india is a very typical uh, uh, un- uh, country and everybody has different accents so on a call center you know we do a lot of voice based authentication which is done in english and covers you know about 20000 pin codes that we are available within the country yeah? mm-hmm. uh, the other piece that we have started to do is how do you use ai to get internal productivity within the enterprise so in some of the places we have started seeing can voice be used to actually note down minutes of the meeting okay can it be so good that you know so it's very simple use case but improves productivity can we do this within the uh, how effective uh, is it it's pretty effective uh, even the people have now started coming back to us and saying can we have action points also uh, <laughs> done as voice can it okay. play back the voice so a lot of new demand has come based on that mm-hmm. the other thing that we don't realize you know as a bank is uh, most of you uh, and most of the people here actually touch a bank at the end of their transaction mm-hmm. yeah so the bank pretty much knows uh, what you're doing so we've developed work done work on you know all the data footprints that people le- leave and see what is the best offer you know that one can give what are the kind of things that you should give so for example you know when a new mobile phone comes we actually see based on analytic analytical data who should be given that offer not just you know carpet bombing everybody okay so areas like that are coming up the other piece like he does very rightly is how do you predict failure but how do you take it beyond failure so what we have done is in our data centers uh, we have done put ai enabled iot devices which actually see what is the power consumption that a machine actually needs and how do we reduce the power consumption without actually the ability of machine not to serve work properly so this whole technology actually opens up so many things you know okay. uh, dr madhu very useful make my trip yeah so at make my trip uh, we have uh, several projects i would classify into two categories one is experience and other is efficiency so on the experience front i'd give an example in terms of uh, we get a lot of hotel reviews written by customers who stayed there so we try and parse them understand what you know at least understand and categorize what they are saying for example somebody saying hotel is good but food is bad sure. you know so categorize these things understand this good and bad evaluations and attach them to the right you know entities in this case okay. hotel or food mm-hmm. and so by building up this we are able to improve uh, 
you know, the customer experience in terms of finding the right hotels, what they want to look at, what features they consider as important. But also on the other side, pass, it, pass this feedback on to our partners, which are the hoteliers, for them to understand if so many customers are saying something good about it, okay, I can, you know, I can build on that, but many people are maybe complaining about some aspect of the hotel, then I need to fix that. So in both sides, uh, this kind of information helps, uh, you know, to take an action. Okay. Yeah, on the efficiency front, I would say, and it's kind of coupled with experience, we are looking at how do we improve customer support. I think many panelists touched on this, uh, and conversation, right? So can you escape the tyranny of the IVR, right, you know, which is very structured and rigid? Uh, can we move to a more fluid interface uh, so that not only we can improve customer experience, but we can solve problems faster, reduce the call volume, and so on? Okay, Radha, you, you did pick up the mic for a while, so... No, so I, I, I remembered one thing that uh, uh, when one of the panelists was saying that they use it for annotation, right? Mm. So, so the Skype translate that we had released, right, was the idea was that somebody speaking one language and another person speaking another. Sure. Some of the analysis, what we found, was people are sending it both to English. Mm. And what happens is that there is a a transcript that starts coming up in that language. So they were actually it. using it as a meeting in note taker. So it's very interesting that you actually, see Microsoft provides the platforms uh, in general, right? Mm -hmm. They have the AI platform. People then effectively use it to solve their problems. And in this case, it was a note taking problem. Uh, and you automatically had notes at the end of the, uh, end of the sure, meeting. Sure. Okay, uh, one of the things that we noticed uh, is that the adoption is uh, faster, quicker uh, with startups, with smaller companies, which is, should be ideally also the case. But then why is it that the big corporates are trying to avoid AI? So, Shudipta, you want to take uh, a crack at this and then Radha maybe? I mean, I wouldn't say that big corporates are avoiding AI. Um, I would say that it's a more nuanced approach yeah. most of the organizations are taking, uh, where um, they clearly want the business benefits to be driven out mm -hmm. of an AI initiative. So mm -hmm. I think at least in all my interactions... That's always the case, no, that every business guy would want, you know, this. But what I'm saying is that they're trying to pass off data science, data, data analytics, big data as AI, chatbots. Yeah, I mean, these are really not AI, they are dumb AI, seriously. AI is really machine learning in that, in that sense. So what is, what, is, what is preventing them from going the whole hog? Well, I think um, there is a, uh, every organization goes through different phases uh, in their maturity cycle, right? So uh, some organizations are at the early stages of the maturity where uh, they are just looking at the new concepts right. and uh, they are doing a few proof of concepts in their own organizations, uh, trying to see if that is going to help either in improving their reach to the customer or in terms of improving the efficiency of their operations or just in terms of reducing their risks, right? Then there are other organizations who are past that stage of doing the POC and they now want to do the scale up. Yeah. So for example, if you have done a small proof of concept where you have been able to use, um, say, um, a conversational AI for um, reducing uh, the, the number of people you need to man on the service desk and, has, and have been able to improve the uh, experience of the customer, you would want to roll it out for all your products across all your branches, across all your other departments, right? even internally as well. right? So, so some organizations are on the scale out phase right. once they have tasted the initial success. Mm -hmm. right? uh, what is very critical and important is that like any other hype, which goes, and I think AI is also riding that uh, ma ma hype cycle, is that uh, organizations are now uh, very, very hard-nosed about where they want to spend the money and what is the return on investment they are getting. And the organizations which have tasted the early success are the ones who are going full hog. In fact, we have done a lot of research as well, yes. where we have found that, you know, more than 65%, uh, 70% of the CEOs of the organizations are actually completely behind. Uh, no dispute with uh, that. No on, dispute on with that. What I'm saying is that, is it the fear of failure? And I'll, I'd like to throw this open to the, to the panel and whoever wants to take out. Is it the fear of failure? Because we've seen in, while reporting for this, we found that there are startups who built a whole business model around, around your products, around your rivals' products, and things like that. 
but yet you're not seeing that as far as the large companies are concerned they are you know they're taking very very small steps gingerly into ai you know trying to pass off chatbots as ai trying to pass off you know things like uh, data analytics as ai that's really so that's share, really the question i'll share oh. a very interesting anecdote to that so i was chatting to one of my clients and um, uh, the client shared the business problem to me and i said well do you want industry 4.0 and all that is yes you know, I am not so. He actually told me that you know I am not so much fascinated about all these buzzwords about AI and ML and Industry 4.0 and yes. IoT and IIoT and God knows what. Yes. All I am interested in is that can I improve my um, capacity utilization from 93% to 95%? Yes. Can I reduce my cost of poor, uh, poor quality? That will automatically happen if they do, no? And and he said that you can call it any name you want to. Okay. I I do not really. Too much, give too much of importance to what name you give, okay. as long as it serves my purpose. Okay. And he was actually asking for an AI solution without really calling it an AI solution at you all. You can sell him Sudipto ad intelligence. <laughs> Any, I, I see a lot of lot of mics coming up, so it's interesting that everybody has a point to make on this. I just want to add uh, two more points. I think one is the fact that it's harder and more difficult for a bigger organization to adopt a technology. I mean, the sure. data is bigger. You need to move the data. Sure. You need to may have a solution that works on all, yes. you know, or close to 100% of your data points as opposed to a startup which might have to deal with smaller data, right? And the second is also, uh, you know, when you look at any technology, right, there might be some misses there. And the opportunity cost of getting something wrong might be much bigger for an organization with deep pockets, which Precisely. might be opening itself to lawsuits. So those Precisely. are the two or one fear of failure. Why, uh, the fear of failure. Uh, not so much fear of failure. I mean, you know, imagine that, you know, I put up a chatbot there, which ends up... Uh, uh, Harming you, know, you more than... I'm doing... Uh, you know, it just takes one or two use cases, right? Yes. And then that creates so much of negative PR and lawsuits, etc. So you need to have a much more foolproof solution, and that's some of the reasons why the big organizations might, uh, you know... So I have, I have an interesting thought on the chatbot, and we've mentioned this in, this in the story. This is, a, this is an airline customer writing to the airline, saying that thanks for dropping me in Kolkata and my bags in Hyderabad and chatbot replies thanks uh, glad you enjoyed our experience <laughs> so so chatbots can be can be quite uh, quite difficult uh, so any any other but thoughts I, I uh, dr bhati i think it's also a function of uh, competitive pressures right because some of us who are working in the hyper competitive e-commerce space have no choice but to go all the way and you know adopt ai and Yes. you know, survive, Yes. whereas some of the larger corporates in other areas may not, I mean, so it's like maybe they're figuring out who is the first mover who is going to come and disrupt. Yes. Maybe it's not a challenge as of yet. Yes. So it could also be a function of the market, I would say. Mm. Maybe I, I'd like to add one point, yeah. being a big organization. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I think big organizations are taking those challenges. I think the issues are more around the finer points, you know, what should be the strategy to adopt certain set of technologies, which are the areas you attack first. So for us, you know, we first started off the journey saying let's do it in operations department yes. Yes. and see how robotic process automation helps. Then we got more confidence and went to yes. external customer facing entities and now trying to do everything. The other big challenge that you find is lack of talent. So, you know, while you get good technical expertise, but there are very few technical people who can tie the technology to a complex business problem. So like he rightly said, the business person will only talk in a complex business issue and the technology person or the data analyst will only talk as, you know, some algorithm or this particular way of doing things. Yeah? The last thing, of course, you know, it always depends, you know, how the competition is doing. So for example, today banking is very competitive on technology and everybody is trying to do something in that space. So competition also drives adoption. But I think the broader issues are more around talent and a comprehensive strategy of how to implement a certain technology. Right. So um, actually, he hit a lot of the points I wanted to say. So I'll broadly say it's a resource thing. For mm. And also, I want to see, when you look at any product, or technology also, there's an adoption curve. There are early adopters, and then there are people who fall in, and there are guys who are late adopters as well. And multiple forces actually drive that. One is fear of failure, fear of new technology. Sure. People do like to stay in the true and tested. Hmm. When you go into something new, you don't know what is you happening, what especially with AI where yeah. some of it is probabilistic. Right? Sure. Finally, I want to make one point. Right? If you notice, if you give new technology to a child, and then slightly older person, hmm. you see their adoption curves are quite significantly different because one has no fear. 
and a startup is more like a child right Correct. i mean and they are incentivized to take that risk and be disruptive correct whereas a, a, a bigger company has to answer to a lot of other people but there's a lot is, more at stake there it is. it is so the really successful people are the ones who are willing to take the big change and taking starting in pockets and then in, exactly. you know, expanding it yeah and 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 also the leadership right sure. who's willing to take that risk sure dr badri you had you had no i think this is very very good points maybe just one 10 second point i wanted to add was that um you know the idea that you it, it, you know unimaginable today that you can set any kind of business any kind without like an it backbone or infrastructure right you you can't imagine you know i don't care what industry what shop how big how small and we're sort of in a similar stage where the techniques we are talking about ai yes. machine learning is going to be that in 5 years and the the companies that recognize that today and build to it i don't care whether you're big or small this or that industry mm-hmm. they are the ones who are going to survive okay. and the ones who are sort of late to the game or not rajat you want to make quick point or? yeah just just you know you know while everyone is sharing you know why big companies are you know behind i think one learning that you know i had you know working across multiple companies is that you know if you you know maybe start you know like you said you know maybe you know analytics and chatbots are not you know machine learning and ai but these are the stepping stones and you know you start with you know simpler you know tasks you start with not end customer facing one you start with data analytics you start with you know studying the consumer behavior and <laughs> that really connects with the business so if they start seeing you know, we have you know proof now you know through analytics and through you know using machine learning how you know our targeted communication has brought incremental revenue to business sure how we have kind of driven customers who were not coming to watch movies to come and come back again and come mm-hmm. back more frequently mm-hmm. and how this is more effective than mm-hmm. doing the carpet bombing so once the business gets that you know uh, you know taste of success i think then it becomes much easier to kind of get okay. the corporates to okay I, i mean we're running out of time but yeah sure so um there is a natural resistance to change in whatever you do whether it's a large or a small organization and part of the resistance to that change comes because of lack of knowledge so the typical refrain you would hear is that you know i am experienced in that sector for the last 25 30 years how can an algorithm tell me how to do my job better than what i already know sure. right this is usually the problem mm. now the genesis of that problem comes from the fact that many people do not understand what that algorithm is doing which actually means that if you if somebody can explain that the algorithm is nothing but processing the same set of business rules which you are actually processing in your head but in a much faster manner yeah. so that it can aid in the decision making then the acceptability improves yeah. the second problem is the quality of the data right so if you get to a decision where it is because uh, because your data is not correct or you are not finding it right then you lose trust sure. in terms of what is coming up so i would say that um, uh, communication across all levels in Very terms critical. of knowledge and the ability to look at the right set of data for arriving at the conclusions right. will be key to the fundamentals of breaking this resistance to change okay we have a lot to talk but i think we have enough time for only one uh, maybe one point uh, to take up now and that's the computational challenge essentially the ability of uh, of machines to handle the amount of data that is going to be thrown up or is being thrown up by artificial intelligence machines and and products uh, so uh, what is uh, and this is open to the to the panel whoever wants to take this up basically where do you see this headed is is right now if you look at it ai is largely being computed on the servers very rarely on the terminal end of the of the product it's not necessarily so much on the uh, you know it's not on the echo device it's on the server again it's not on the phone it's on the server but you know devices of the future which way are we headed is it going to be most more server largely server or uh, are we heading towards actually computing happening at the uh, at the terminal end like i i was i was just going to give the example of for instance the autonomous cars there is no option there but to compute it at, in the car and that poses enormous computational challenges so what do you which way do you see this is headed it's it's open to so i'll just make a couple of quick remarks and i think refer back to satyam actually brought this up in his keynote as well sure so 
you know, to your point, um, it's not really an either or, it's both. So several companies, NVIDIA for example, is developing more and more powerful chips to do more and more computation at the edge. But the answer is, I think this is a co-evolution of hardware and technologies and software, if you want yeah. to call it that. So the, I, I think the model that a lot of applications are getting to is data gathering at the edge, processing the cloud, syncing overnight, and then bringing that learning back to make the edge also become a device, whatever it is, become more intelligent in that way. So it's, they are not truly independent, but a sort of a hybrid effort between what's in going on the cloud and, and what's going on the cloud. Terminal end. Okay. I think uh, I agree with uh, Dr. Badri that it's going to be a mixed bag. I'll just uh, mention th uh, three or four different points. One is the fact that uh, 5G is coming. I know Japan mm. is going to start uh, mm. testing it out soon and other countries mm. will. Mm. And that's going to give us the kind of connectivity between our devices and the cloud mm -hmm. that will probably allow us to do some of the simple cognitive tasks. But then, of course, with uh, newer algorithms, newer use cases, we might even hog up that bandwidth. On the other end, uh, energy is going to be still a challenge. So if you put really expensive chips on the device, you cannot power them. I think there are some physics to it in terms of how you know, big your battery packs can get. So with these two points, I feel that it's still going to, going to be mostly in the server because of better bandwidth and the fact that there's going to be better energy availability in the cloud. But then there will be certain use cases like the car and so on yeah. where, where some it, has, that to be move, at it the has to be at terminal the terminal end. Okay. Are you, uh, Dr. Yeah. So uh, just to add to that, I think I mostly agree it's going to be a hybrid model and it's dictated by use cases. But there are also some interesting algorithmic innovations happening in. For example, I think Google published a paper sometime early this year about a federated model where you, know, you don't want to ship all the customer data on the device to the cloud uh, you know, because of privacy violations and so on. So you can compute some part, maybe anonymize it, you know, learn some part of the problem on the device, but the rest, you know, maybe an average form can be shifted to the cloud, right? Sure. So that way, uh, privacy can be protected. So there are, I guess it will be based on different use cases and the computing power available. Yeah. Okay. Mayur, you had a thought? You had a thought? Yeah. So, you know, uh, um, you know, what I've seen is that the training part, the machine learning part requires a lot more computation. And the application of that, you know, algorithm is not that computationally intensive. So, you know, so that, you know, where you need to, you know, train the model, I think that is where the cloud compute and, you know, GPUs available really makes it much easier. Okay. And then, you know, like everyone is saying, you know, a lot of uh, applicability of that model can be moved to the edges, to the mobile phones and other sure. devices. Sure. I, I think uh, it's, it's a hybrid model for the most part. Um, actually, as we start cracking these problems, more and more complex cognitive ta uh, tasks start coming up, which will require more and more power. Sure. And so it's going to be fundamentally, a l the heavy lifting is going to be done in the, the cloud. Server, yeah. And I think uh, connectivity is going to improve. Okay. So, you know, it's going to be uh, ever-pervading. But you still need collection, uh, data collection and actually manifestation of the output. So there's going to be uh, definitely a hybrid model. Okay. Uh, we have precisely five minutes left, and uh, the question that I, have, that I wanted to raise was um, the, the last number that we looked at in 2016, uh, the amount of investment that has happened in the industry, AI industry, the U.S. did 67 percent, China did 17, 18 percent, and then there was the rest of the world. Uh, India has precise, you know, almost all the ingredients. We have data that China also, uh, you know, uh, has this amount of data that they will be generating. We would have probably this equal and equivalent amount. We have techies, and we have a natural alignment with companies which are U.S.-based rather than, and yet, we are not able to make, uh, we're not making headway in making India the hub of at least some of the AI applications. Uh, what's the reason? It's open to the panel, whoever wants to take it. I would just take that. So um, I'll just sh uh, share with you some statistics, um, just to take a slightly contrarian point of view. Um, we have probably more than 150 plus startups already 
it could be even more yeah you know? about 200 or so uh, what we uh, around yeah. 200 yes. right so and uh, if you look at their products or their solutions they are primarily ai driven yeah. you know and these are ai say, startups when i am saying ai all kinds of ai Correct. you know across multiple industries um that is something which is a fantastic achievement given the fact that this subject is so new and young in fact when we also um uh, try to create those you know um, uh, sessions with with the startups we see a tremendous amount of not just uh, the number of people the, the number of people who are there but also the depth of those solutions sure. which are there in place sure. right so uh, so that's one second is that uh, if you look at some of the areas which we have done taken a lot of strides and we do not talk a lot about it so i'll give you some examples like uh, drip irrigation yeah. is an example yeah. right where we have used ai yeah. for flowing for controlling the flow of water yeah. depending on the pressure at yeah. a particular point in time knowing fully well that there are regions which is water deficient and natural water you know uh, water is going to be a scarce resource anyways uh, we, we have done that very very successfully when we are talking about the smart cities and talking about the next gen cities we are ab- adopting uh, that uh, if you look at use cases around the drones sure where we are looking at the aerial image of a of a large field yeah and then using that to predict the productivity of a particular farmland or even predicting how much is going to be the yield sure. depending on the aerial image that itself is a very very revolutionary thing we did a study uh, last year where we uh, looked at healthcare as a sector mm. and uh, what we realized was that for example if we have to move the maturity of our healthcare to a um you know to a, a level of a developed country we simply cannot produce so many doctors sure. or cannot have sure. so many hospital beds uh, yeah. which is where then you need to take the healthcare back to the yeah. individual so i would say so there are you think there, there are, are lots of useful things which are happening mm-hmm. maybe it is not getting the right sure. kind of attention yeah. and audience yeah. but i would say, uh, say that you know this is very very upcoming okay. very fast okay. and to talk to the people yeah. uh, you know we we can definitely we are definitely one of the best in the world sure. to have adopted ai you know globally okay so i th- i think there is a serious underinvestment especially in ai research in india if you look at companies like alibaba investing you know million billions uh, that's one problem the second i'm worried in the indian context is that uh, you know as these ai technologies become more and more mature they become very specialized in tasks like you know reading maybe writing journal you know maybe in producing stories whatever right so there is a phenomenon that people are calling as the hollowing out of the middle class sure. which may take away a lot of the middle income jobs and in a country like india that could be a serious challenge where yeah. uh, you know reducing a, or rather losing a lot of you know reasonably well paying jobs due to ai okay so so that's something of okay. serious okay. concern okay mayur 10 seconds if possible yeah just yeah. one view point yeah. serious uh, level of uh, talent dearth yeah. at the high levels in india and i was just coming from a conference where we see that the chinese government is giving like insane yeah, giving amount of incentives absolutely. to attract back talent 300 billion dollar of investment in in ai uh, creation uh, dr bazi yeah. you had some thoughts no I- exactly so the, i think the uh, the other thing i'll add is that you know you need that sort of national coordinated sponsorship singapore right. is doing that as well the chinese government is doing that yeah. and the other missing ingredient we may have startups but there's no real mature industry research yeah. you know combination at least at scale and that's something we still need to that's develop that's also missing brother you want to say the last i i was going to make the same point about yeah. the government okay. right uh, but the second thing is just one quick note it's not necessarily a bad thing we can wait for some ma- technologies to mature and then jump into it but in terms of research and infrastructure we really do need to uh, invest heavily well really i mean the more we keep out of the government the better it is probably for the industry <laughs> um, maybe <laughs> you one know, last point. it it is didn't, didn't need any government uh, yeah so so maybe india is not at the forefront but if you see silicon valley many indians, indians are at have, the forefront yes. of doing this interesting point well we are we are out of time I'd like to thank you it was a very very interesting discussion thank you all for your time thanks for coming over